This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. My message, Seeking the Face of God. Seeking the Face of God. Psalm 27. <clears throat> Verse 7 and verse 8, Psalm 27. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou said, saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Verse 8 is my message. Lord, when you said, seek my face, my heart said unto you, thy face, Lord, Will I seek? Bless this word, Lord. Anoint it. Open our hearts to receive it, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Here in Psalm 27, he prays, Lord, hear when I cry. Have mercy. Answer me. David had one all-consuming prayer. And if you look at verse 4, we find his consuming prayer. There's one desire. Folks, he's looked over his life. And he's, he's come down. It's come down to one issue. It's come down to one prayer, one desire. He wraps up his whole life. There's nothing else he wants out of life, out of his future. There's one master desire. Now, that's an amazing thing when a man or a woman can tell you, when you ask them, what's the one goal in your life? What's the one thing you want more than anything else? I ask you that question. What is the one thing that you want out of life? One mission, one pastor in, in Europe told me, he said, would you pray for me? I want to win 10 million souls to Jesus. Well, that's, that's, that's a wonderful thought. But that's not what David had in mind. I don't know what your thought may be. If you could say the one thing, the one desire you have in life that you're going to spend your life, rest of your life seeking to obtain. And here it is in verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. One thing I want. Now, he's not talking about leaving his call, leaving the throne, and moving into the temple, into the house of God. That, that's not what he's talking about. He, there's something spiritual he sees. There's something very deep in his heart. There's a longing. You see, he's not an ascetic. He's not a hermit. He's a warrior. He's an active man. He's a passionate man. He's not just trying to shut everything down in his life. He's going to continue doing what he has been doing. He's going to go out to warfare. And he's been through this. Now, here's a man who's tasted of everything that a man could ever want in his life. Here's a man that's known power, authority, respect. He's known the applause of the multitudes. To him they sang, David has killed his tens of thousands. Here's, here's a man who had a heart for God. Here's a man whose heart panted after the Lord, a man of prayer, a godly man. And yet there's something missing. There's something he has not obtained. He's facing a host at the time of the, in the 27th Psalm. There's a host that's come against him. A huge host, an army of enemies coming. And they've sworn to eat him up. Those are the very words, to eat him up. I'm going to eat you alive, the enemy said. 
going to consume you. And, and David's not going to God now and his prayer is not, oh, Lord, deliver me from money. That's not his own prayer. He's saying, I want something now that truly satisfies my soul. I, I want something deeper than I have ever known in the Lord. He, he said, I have one goal now, and that's uninterrupted communion with my Lord. He doesn't want to move into the house. He knows that's impossible. But he knows one thing, that the tabernacle is where the presence of God is. He knows that the house of God is to be called a house of prayer. And he goes into the house of God. And I believe David saw something that just, just did not satisfy his heart. He saw the images. He saw the, the altar. He saw the labor. He saw the sacrifice. He said there's got to be something behind it. And I, I believe with all my heart, <clears throat> David's not afraid of his enemies. He said, I, I will not be afraid. He said, the Lord is my strength. He's a praying man. He knows the Lord is his strength. He's not fearful. But he said, there's something missing. There's something missing. And, and there are millions and millions of godly Christians, those who love the Lord, but they know that there, there is something that there's an inner longing that has not been quite satisfied. There's an unmet spiritual need yet. There's something out there, something deeper. There's a beauty. There's a glory. There's an excitement about who the Lord is that I have not seen that would give me something to see me through the rest of my life. Something I could give my life to that would be my goal, my only ambition, my only agenda boils down to one thing. I want to know what it's like to have uninterrupted communion. I want to be able to call on him at any day. I, I want to be have my life to be a life of prayer. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. In other words, I want to I want to be one who prays constantly. In other words, my life is the prayer itself. He said, "There's something in me. I've known victories. I've prayed about victories. I've prayed about these things. I've seen God's hand. I've been delivered." But in spite of all of my deliverances and these flashes of blessing and anointings, he said, there's something that is not steadfast. There's something I'm longing for, unshakable, uninterrupted. Some kind of a walk with God that I've not yet seen or experienced. And folks, David, I believe... Got tired of dead ritual in the house of God. He tired of the ceremonies. He sees the lamb and he says, they talk about the lamb. Go, Who is the lamb of God? I want to know this lamb. I want to know what those candlesticks burning mean. What's the fire mean on the altar? What are these things? What's behind that? And David's heart cries out. I believe when he goes to the house of God, and David loved the house of God. And he said, this is death. This, this, this is why people are going to the idols, because they don't feel life here. The word of God, the, the priests come and deliver the word, but it's a dead letter now. It's knowledge. And we've been given this knowledge over and over again. It's knowledge. But there, there is nothing of life to it. The number one complaint I get on our mailing list from hundreds of thousands of people from around the world, my church is dead. One young lady wrote, and she said, you can tell when a preacher is praying. You can tell whether you're just getting something that he got from studies rather from his prayer. He said, because even the most biblically strict message can be dry bones if it's not bathed in prayer and the congregation can tell. And I think David felt that, 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 that there's something missing of life. There's something missing of excitement. This is death and that's why I leave the house of God with my soul cast down. And I'm saying I've been to church, but why is my soul cast down? 
And I believe David made a decision. He said, I've had it. I am not going to live out the rest of my days with these unmet spiritual needs. There's something calling me. There's something out there behind the scene that I have not yet gotten a hold of. And I'm going to make that the goal of my life. One thing I desire and one thing I have set my heart to. And that is that I can dwell in his presence and inquire of him. In other words, I want to know who he is. I want to see his face. <clears throat> so David goes to his own house and he says, I think he's saying, if, if the house of God, if the tabernacle of God is the house of prayer, I'm going to make my house a house of prayer. And I, I'm going to give myself. To seeking him until I find. He does not go to his priest, Abiathar or Zadok. Zadok's a godly man. You see, you're not going to get what I'm talking about to you from your pastors. You're not going to get it from teaching. You're going to get it until you're sick and tired of the ritual of your own life. Going through the same motions, trying to find the depths of Christ. And you have not found it yet because... Somewhere along the line, you got stuck in front of a television set and you neglected your Bible and got dead inside and you turned your own prayer life and everything else into a ritual. And now it's left you hungry. But I'm saying even the godly people who pray, even those who are under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, they're always reaching out to this one Eternal, glorious joy, something that will take me to the coming of the Lord and see me all the way through eternity. It's a relationship. It's an uninterrupted intimacy with Jesus Christ. And there's something out there. And just as sure as the Bible says Moses saw his day, the day of Christ, and rejoiced in it. I believe David saw the day of the Messiah and began to yearn after it for a revelation of the face of this great Messiah. So David goes home to pray. And that's where verse 7 comes in. O oh Lord, hear this cry of mine. Hear my voice. Answer me. Lord, I want to know you. God answers him with three words. David says, have mercy on me. Oh God, there's a hunger in me. There's a God, have mercy. I'm so hungry. I have a host of enemies coming against me. I've had so many battles in my life, but oh God, for one time. Lord, open your heart to me. I want to know you. I want to see you. And the Lord answers him with three words. Seek my face. Now, this is not a call to prayer. David's been praying seven times a day. This is not a call. Well, go spend more time. Yes, thank God for more time. Thank God for all the Bible study and all of that. But the face of God is his reflection. It's his likeness. This is a call to get to know who the Lord is so you can live like him. To seek the face of God is to seek the knowledge of who he is, how he acts toward mankind, how he, how his very nature and who he is, so that you can spend your time reaching out, seeking Jesus. Is this the way you would do it? Is this how you would treat? First, you start with your wife, your husband, your friends on the job. Everywhere, seeking the face of Jesus is not just a call to prayer. It's a call to a hunger and a thirst in the soul to seek in your life a lifestyle that totally reflects who Jesus is. My Bible said he is the express image of the Father. And I thank God. I thank God for that day that God took on a face. You see, David kept crying out, Oh, Lord, show me your face. Why are you hidden? 
Job said God's hid in his face. And, and one of his advisors said, if God's hid his face, why seek him? And that was the heart of his, of his complaint to Job. And in the Old Testament, it was hard because his face had not been fully revealed. Jesus Christ is the face of God. The express image. The exact. Chiseled. Engraved. As is. Same essence. Same glory. He is God in flesh. And folks, we have the privilege of seeing his face, of touching him because he took on a face. He took on the image of man. He took on the form of man. He came to feel my pain and your pain. He came to be tempted as you and I are tempted. He came to live as you and I have lived to show that a man can live wholly dependent on the father. Totally, wholly dependent on that he can have an interrupted fellowship. You can live as he did and say, I don't do anything except I see and hear it from my Savior. This is the Christ of Calvary. But today when you hear these words, seek my face it is taking on now implications beyond any generation we've ever known when i tell you i want you to listen closely to what i'm about to share with you this is a prophetic word and i want you to get it deep in your soul i'm saying it again when god says to this generation seek my face in other words seek to know the real christ the implications today are beyond anything history has ever known. Because the question now by multitudes is, which Jesus? Which Jesus? The scripture warns there will come many Christs deceiving many. Matthew 24, 5. In fact, Jesus said just before he comes, this will be the one great sign that Christ is at the door at the end of all things is about to happen. The disciples asked Jesus, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus said, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. In Matthew twenty four twenty three, he said, They'll say, here's Christ, and there's Christ. Jesus said, do not believe them. This is not a bunch of crazies running around, dressed in white robes and long beards, saying, I'm the Son of God. That's not what he's saying. He's not even talking about men. He's talking about Christ concepts that are coming. Concepts, definitions, explanations of who they believe Jesus is. A Jesus of their own making, of their own imagination. And he said there are going to be many. And they're going to say, no, here's what Christ is like. Here's what Jesus is like. And over here said, no, here's what Jesus is like. Until there is such confusion. In Matthew 13, 22, false Christ and false prophets shall rise to seduce the elect, if possible. False Christ will seduce the elect. I, that, that sentence used to intrigue me. How, how can anybody be deceived by somebody who said, I'm Christ? I'm Christ. They'd be laughed out of church. They'd be laughed out of society. That's not what it means. The reality is, these are concepts. These are going to be, this is going to be teachings by false prophets who've transformed themselves into angels of light to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. He's warning about the coming of a new Jesus movement. Educated men who have left the authority of the scripture who no longer believe in the power of prayer 
who have formed their own concepts of a radical Christ, a radical Jesus, that would appeal to young people especially and young ministers. Radicalism. Communion, they talk about. Social justice. All good things. But it's a new gospel, another gospel, and it's all about another Christ. In no uncertain terms, Paul warned us, there will become those who are corrupted from the simplicity of the gospel. There will come false prophets transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Satan himself will be transformed into an angel of light. And his ministers will be transformed into the ministers of righteousness. They will come talking about a new kind of holiness. And that being love your brother, love your sister, do good to the poor. All things that good Christians do anyhow. I want to speak to you about this new movement. It's a new kind of church that is springing up all over the world. They call themselves the Emerging Church. It was in the New York Times. It's been, it's the number one religious thing on internet now. It's being pushed by bloggers. They meet in little groups. And they are those that have claimed that they have mega church burnout. They're burned out from the bigness. They're burned out from the preaching of self-improvement. They came to these churches really as seekers. They came wanting something real. And what they got was a self-improvement message of how to improve your image and reach your physical goals. When all along they said, we went to find reality and we were cheated. One news reporter who walked out of a mega church. Now, when I talk about mega church, we're not we're not putting a, 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 we're not covering the whole mega movement. The, the, this church has thousands of people would probably be called a mega church, but we're talking about those churches. Well, it'll be explained here in what this young man said. He said we got mega burnout. Most of the young people tired of the shallow gospel of self-fulfillment. They said a Barna Group survey showed that 10 to 12 million born-again Christians, believers, have stopped going to church now. 10 to 12 born-again believers, most of them young people and baby boomers, as they're called. So we were seekers. We wanted a church that was an asylum from iPods and TiVos, Xboxes, competition and bigness. And the church deceived us. It was not a, an asylum that we found from the world. But we found Disney World. A world of skating, sport leagues, cafes, game rooms. The same stuff we were already bored with. You're going to hear more and more about this movement Folks, in 50 years of ministry, I have seen the winds and waves of doctrine coming and going. Movements that rise and fall and leave shipwreck everywhere. This is different. All of that was before Internet and before bloggers and before chat rooms and before there could be in just one week a false doctrine or doctrine of demons sweep the whole world in just a short time. It's a whole different game, and this will not go away because what we're seeing now is the last attack of the enemy before Jesus comes. Another gospel, another Christ. He's saying, no more, no more crucify him. No more trying to get to reject this Christ of the cross. Let's bring in our own Jesus. Let's dress him up and make him like man acceptable. To anybody. And so now the devil has introduced a new Christ, a new doctrine. And folks, believe me, these ministers that are preaching this are educated people. They are not uh, hippies. They are writing books as theologians. 
and they are interconnected now and there are they meet in little groups. One writer said we were told that all that was all this stuff was meant to attract seekers. But we asked the question attracted to what? Because we search the scriptures and we find nothing in this that resembles the book of Acts. We don't find the book of Acts in church. The truth is most of these that are called seekers are really seeking the face of Christ. They're wanting to know how to live like Jesus. They don't want to live in sin. They, they, there's, there's something about sin that absolutely destroys the fabric of the family. It destroys the conscience. It destroys the meaning of life. And I don't care what kind of house you live in. I don't care if you drive a Mercedes or a, a Rolls Royce. I don't care how much money you have in the bank where there's sin destroying. There can be no joy, no happiness, no peace. And when you come to the end of yourself, you want to go to church. And you don't want a little sermonette. You don't want somebody to tell you how good you are. You want to be convicted of your sins. And that's what this generation is looking for. They're saying, we want to hear pastors that pray. We want to hear pastors that preach Jesus and live the Christ that they preach. We want somebody not trying to get our money, but to get to our hearts. We want to hear from the throne of God. We don't want to hear some man's, some concept of who Jesus is. We want the biblical Christ, the one who shed his blood, the blood-stained hands of a crucified Christ. From Dallas, Texas News, says... These emerging churches weave together elements from different religious traditions, especially Catholicism, Eastern, Eastern Orthodoxy. Some are reviving medieval mystical practices such as walking the labyrinth. In other words, have different stages around the room. Over here you can have a cross uh, uh, in chalk on the floor. You go and write your name on that cross so that you know your sins are pinned to the cross. You go over here to the candle section and you can light a candle. You go over here and you can just fellowship with somebody. And over here you can take uh, a, a piece of uh, <clears throat> a, a cake and a Pepsi and have communion. That's exactly what New York Times said. Walking the labyrinth. It's a special, and here it says, it's a pick yourself, mix and match approach to the gospel, stressing community and social justice. Hell is rejected because it makes God look like a torturer. So now there are images, candles, incense. We are trying to get, here's what they say, we're trying to get reconnected to Jesus the radical Jesus. They say we want to put a more humane face on Christ, on Jesus. I want you to go with me to Galatians, the first chapter, the first chapter of Galatians in your Bible, please. I want to show you what Paul the Apostle says. If there's any other Christ other than Paul preached... He's a fake. First chapter of Galatians. I'm sorry, verse 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Beloved, those days have come. How do we know that Jesus is coming? Because he said just before he comes, many Christ, many Gospels will appear. Which is not another Gospel. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other Gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, 
If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not from man. And I didn't receive it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is a revelation. And now they're saying, let us reason together and let us see if we define. In fact, one of the top leaders of this new emerging church movement has said, clarity is good, but intrigue is better. Intrigue. Think about that for just a moment. Intrigue is subterfuge. It's clandestine effort to impress or to influence. Clandestine effort. He said, they, they said clarity. Folks, the very foundation of the knowledge of Christ, the very foundation of the Word of God is clarity. Simple. They're being removed from the simplicity, the clarity of the gospel. Moving into intrigue in what they're saying. Let us get together and find out behind the message what Jesus really meant. In other words, they're putting their own face. On the face of Christ. The Bible said they made him a man like unto themselves. So now it is you can worship with the Buddhists. You can worship with the Islamic because Jesus is love. That's where it's headed. You say, Brother Dave, I didn't know anything about this. Well, you're going to hear more and more about it. And God is always on time. But they, the very words, the very foundation, and I, I get this right from their writings. Everything now is negotiable. In other words, take a look at the whole gospel. Let's redefine it. Let's look at Jesus and redefine who he is. Now, I've got a warning for every young pastor that may be here, every young person that's in the Internet, and you like to surf the Internet, and you want to, you've want you got a hungry heart, and so you're searching, and you're going to bookstores, and you're picking up books by these writers about the new brands of Christianity, new definitions of Jesus Christ. And it's very intriguing, very well written, very seductive. But I'm telling you, the bait, the bait is Jesus, a radical Jesus who will be against war, a radical Jesus that's going to bring down the establishment, a radical Jesus that will wipe out poverty. Folks, are, we know what Jesus Christ is in all of those human matters. We know our meek Savior who loved the poor. And you know the love that Christ gives to his body for the widows and the orphans and all. But you see, along with that radicalism, this neo-radicalism, there, there's something deeper than that. And it all goes to the divinity of Jesus Christ. To bring Jesus down. And you see, it's no more a mirror. See, the word of God is a mirror that shows you Christ. And so that you can reflect that image to the world. You don't mar that image. The world is not to see you, they're to see the reflection of Christ through you and through me. But now you see, I define Jesus and it's not a mirror, it's a painting now. I can paint his face. I can describe him. He looks just like me. He... He is what I believe he is. He's what I think he is. So everybody's got their paintbrush and everybody's got their canvas. And this blogger over here says, no, we have found a new way to bring Jesus in. And no, it said, well, we've added this. And so now, and they call it, their very words, it's a little messy. But you have to have messiness. You have to have intrigue. <sighs> Folks, this is an attack on the, the absolute godness of Jesus Christ. 
to make him a man. This is where the Islamics are going. I've been warning for years, now 10 years, about the new world church order that's coming. And I've wondered how could, how could you get denominations to come in to a world church coming out of Europe, coming out of Brussels. A church that has all power and all authority, who can jail anyone else who will not go with them. They're already doing that in some countries where a pastor speaks about homosexuality from his pulpit. It's happened in Sweden. It's happening in other countries now. One world church. And how will all the denominations come in? How will the Catholic church come in? How will the Protestant? How would charismatics come into that? Because many of these in this movement come from a charismatic background. How could anybody, because the mantra, the hook is Jesus. Not Jesus God, not Jesus Christ, but Jesus, a prophet, a man. And folks, this is why the cry goes out from the heart of God. Seek my face. I have to have a people who so reflect me that the world doesn't have to go to a book. They don't have to go to the Internet. They don't have to go somewhere else but to their neighbor. They go to you. They go to me and they say, I know where Christ is. I know what his face is like. I know a man. I know a woman wholly dependent on him who walk and talk like him. We have to be the face of Jesus Christ.